Eva Corja Agus Falcha Galina Sirchi. Hello friends and welcome to the Guinness in the Liberties Walking Tour. My name is Donald Fallon, I'm a historian of modern Dublin. And my name is Evelyn Colgan and I manage the Guinness Archive based right here at the Guinness Storehouse in Dublin. The Guinness in the Liberties Walking Tour has been part of the festival programme for many years now and this year we're delighted to bring it to you virtually. Today I'm going to be focusing on the broad social history of the Liberties area, where this area came from and how it's changed with time. And Evelyn's going to focus on the role of the Guinness Brewery and indeed the Guinness family in the history of the Liberties. So sit back for the next half hour and join us on this tour as we take you through the historic streets of the Liberties in Dublin. When we're talking about the Liberties, first of all, we have to understand why are they called the Liberties? You might think with a name like that, it has something to do with a great rebellious or revolutionary spirit, the Rebel Liberties, uh, as it's known. But in fact, the name has nothing to do with any such revolutionary connotations. Instead, the Liberties area of Dublin was kind of beyond the city of Dublin. For me, it's the great contradiction about the Liberties. Somewhere that is so synonymous with the city and our identity as Dubliners was actually once beyond the walls of Dublin. So what do we mean when we talk about the walls of Dublin? Well, there you go. Here on Lamb Alley, we have one of the last surviving parts of the medieval wall that once surrounded Dublin. Dublin was born as a very humble Viking town around the year 841. They built a kind of wattle fence around Dublin. But the Anglo-Normans, our nearest and dearest, took it one step further and built a stone wall. And believe it or not, there was a very unpopular wall tax to go along with it and to make it a reality. This area of the city, the Liberties, is synonymous with many things. But for me, it brings to mind, amongst other things, migration. French Huguenot Protestant refugees who arrived in Dublin in the late 17th and early 18th century established weaving in this area. It's also connected with some of the most enduring characters in the history of the city. Jonathan Swift, Arthur Guinness, Robert Emmett. And we're going to go on a journey through the Liberties now. in our Guinness story is here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. The Guinness family have long had an association with the cathedral going right back to our founder Arthur Guinness in the 1700s. The cathedral itself, the foundations of it, date back to the early 1100s which actually put it right in tandem with the great European cathedrals of Notre Dame in Paris. But there was a problem. It was built over the River Poddle. So by the 1800s, the building itself was literally starting to cave in on itself. And the Guinness family, in particular, Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness, came to the rescue. He had been really successful from building up his brewery very nearby in St. James's Gate. And he put in and invested 150,000 pounds of his own money into the restoration of the cathedral. Importantly, he didn't just provide the financing, he provided the architectural vision as well. And actually today, 160 years later, that restoration continues with the work that's happening on the cathedral behind us. The Guinness family had a huge influence in this part of the city, so much so that St. Patrick's Close, as it's known as today, was actually known as Guinness Street back in the 1800s. And that's because of the Guinness family involvement, not just in St. Patrick's Cathedral, but also in the restoration of Marsh's Library, another one of our hidden gems here in the Liberties. One of the hidden gems of the Liberties is the John's Lane Church. It includes art by some of the most prestigious stained glass window artists in Ireland, including the brilliant Harry Clark Studios. John's Lane Church is the work of the Pew family, one of the leading architectural firms in these islands when it came to churches, but more besides. Their CV includes, believe it or not, Westminster Palace. And this is a pretty impressive church that is the tallest church spire in the city of Dublin. If you step inside of the church, you can see the very distinctive work of Harry Clark Studios. Beautiful, very gothic stained glass windows. Harry Clark was just 41 years of age at the time of his passing in the early 1930s. Many people go to the National Gallery of Ireland to see Harry Clark's work, but you can see it right here in the heart of the Liberties too. 
The statues outside the church are the work of James Pierce. That's a familiar surname for a reason. James was the father of Patrick and Willie Pierce, two of the leaders of the 1916 Rising. An English Unitarian, he nonetheless made most of his money putting statues in and on Catholic churches. Patrick Pierce once said that if ever you step into a church in Dublin and you see something beautiful before your eyes, there's a very good chance it was done by my father. So James Pierce, William Pierce, Harry Clark, all these artists who left their mark on Dublin and their work to be found right here in the heart of the Liberties. Colloquially, the church was known locally as the Fenian Church for a long, long time. So many of the labourers who worked on it were members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, a secret underground society better known as the Fenians, born on St. Patrick's Day, 1858. They had a very, very strange relationship with the Catholic Church, it should be said. One bishop on record is saying, hell is not hot enough, nor eternity long enough to punish the Fenians for their actions. It's interesting to imagine those revolutionaries at war with the church, building one in the Liberties. to believe standing in this beautiful park today that this area was actually the site of one of Dublin's poorest slumland areas in the late 1800s. The Guinness family who had restored St Patrick's Cathedral in the 1860s actually purchased this site in the 1890s and built not just social housing but laid out an important green space for the people of the Liberties to enjoy and certainly we're enjoying it over 150 years later. But Edward Cecil Guinness, who was titled the first Lord Iva by Queen Victoria as a result of his charitable deeds, was hugely influential in laying out this area within the Liberties. Just behind me here we have the Ivy Buildings and this was social housing that the Guinness family built for the greater good of the poor people living in this part of Dublin city. Not necessarily only those who were employed in the brewery, but actually those who lived within this part of the city. Really, really well built housing. He also built bathing facilities when indoor sanitation wasn't the norm back in the 1890s. He built Ireland's first creche, this beautiful building behind me, known locally in the area as the Baino. So bean feast is an old medieval term for a feast where you bring food. And in good old Dublin Liberty slang, that became a bridge to the Baino. And there's so many stories of generations of children going to the Baino, drinking their cup of cocoa, eating their sticky bun from Kennedy's Bakery just down the road, and providing really that really essential nutrition to children in the area. So the whole ethos of the Ivy Trust wasn't just about providing amazing built quality housing, it was about providing a community space for the people within the Liberties to live and to enjoy. And certainly that legacy lives on over 100 years later. Dublin has a long tradition of street trading and street traders, in particular female street traders. We immortalised one of them, of course, the famous Molly Malone. But you still find street trading happening in the heart of the Liberties. And when we're speaking about the heart of the Liberties, what do we mean? Well, in particular, we mean Mead Street. Fruit, veg, everything else you can imagine still sold here on the streets. And also thriving popular markets like the Liberty Market behind me. Some of the names on Mead Street have been here for a long, long time, like Larkin's Family Butchers. Others are new, like Lucky's and Legit Coffee, or Legged Coffee, depending who you ask, in the area. There's a brilliant mix of the old and the new side by side on this most historic of streets. In this area, female workers are celebrated through a series of beautiful murals entitled Manaw Mead Street, commissioned by Rowan Co. for International Women's Day last year. They also honour other characters like Constance Markovic, better known as Countess Markovic, the first female MP ever elected to the British Parliament in 1918. She was elected for the St Patrick's Division of Dublin, that is the area in which we are standing. Markovic is remembered for telling women to dress appropriately in short skirts and strong boots, leave your jewels in the bank and buy a revolver. 
My favourite of the murals honours Marion Johnson, from the Liberties, a founding member of the Irish Women's Liberation Movement in the 1970s, who did so much to break down barriers in Irish society, and also a brilliant social historian who did much to capture the story of the people of the Liberties herself. area of Dublin was known for three major industries, distilling, weaving and brewing. And actually right throughout the 1800s there was dozens of breweries scattered right throughout the Liberties area, one of which was the old Sweetman's Brewery, the site of which is just behind me. The Sweetman Brewery closed its doors in the 1890s and Edward Cecil Guinness, the fourth generation of the Guinness family, purchased the land and converted it into the Ivy Markets. The Ivy Markets was the last piece of the puzzle of the Ivy Trust. He had already provided housing, a hostel, swimming baths, and now with the provision of the Ivy Markets, for the first time in this area in Dublin, there was an indoor market to serve the people of the Liberties. At the front of the market, it was known as a dry market, where there was haberdashery, pieces of cloth that you could buy, and the back of the building was the wet market, where you went to buy your fruit, your vegetables and your fish. There was also isolation and sanitation areas. In this area of Dublin, where people lived in very close quarters, it was really important to have sanitation baths to stop and prevent the spread of cholera and other infectious diseases in the 1900s. Another lovely point about this building is that at the front of the building there's the heads depicting the various different nations of the world where the Dublin traders in the Liberties were trading with. So there's a Native American Indian, there's a gentleman with a turban representing trade with the Far East. So a beautiful gem of architecture right here in the heart of the Liberties building. And there are hopes, certainly as part of the future generation of the Liberties, to regenerate this Ivy Markets building as a really thriving place for the community here within the Liberties area. When we think of the Liberties, of course, one iconic harp comes to mind, the logo of the Guinness Brewery. But there's another harp too, the insignia of the Society of United Irishmen, that revolutionary organisation that emerged in Ireland in the late 18th century. Around the harp they put the words, equality, it is new strong and it shall be heard. Perhaps the most romanticised of all the United Irishmen was young Robert Emmett, who went to his death here outside St Catherine's Church in September 1803, just 25 years of age. When we think about the world and the liberties, you know, it's easy to talk about the people who settled here, like those French weavers. But what about the ideas of the world? It was the American and French revolutions which inspired young men like Robert Emmett. Emmett is probably best remembered for the very last chapter of his life story and the incredible speech he gave in court defending his actions. When my country takes her place among the free nations of the earth, then and only then let my epitaph be written. I am done. He was the last man in Ireland sentenced to be hung, drawn and quartered. And a crowd of thousands gathered here to watch the sad end of Robert Emmett. Emmett became an inspiration to the generations of Irish nationalists who followed. In 1916, when the rebels were defeated and marched up this street towards Richmond Barracks and in Chicor, they took off their hats and saluted outside the church where Emmett had been hung. Guinness Brewery was by far the largest employer within not just Dublin but specifically within the Liberties area. We have a statistic that by about 1930, one in 30 Dubliners were dependent on the Guinness Brewery for their livelihood and that stat definitely, definitely increased if you lived here within the Liberties area. These beautiful red brick houses around us were built by the Dublin Artisans Dwelling Company from about the 1890s onwards and certainly are very highly sought after today. But Guinness actually built their own housing for employees as well in Thomas Court, in Bellevue, and later on in Rialto. 
And the benefits of working within Guinness were huge. They provided not just housing, but they provided free medical care, not just to employees, but also to their families. One of the facts that I love is that they employed a midwife from 1901 onwards to look after the wives of brewery employees. They also provided free meals and just this huge range of social care. There's a lovely saying that all women used to say to young girls to catch a Guinness man alive or dead because of all the benefits that came with working in the brewery. The chances were that if you lived in the Liberties and you worked in the brewery, your next door neighbours also worked in the brewery as well. Huge amount of intermarriages happened between families, but that sense of community was very much enhanced by the brewery opening a swimming pool, for example, available to all employees and generations of school children learn to swim in the Skinner swimming pool. The Rupert Guinness Theatre was opened in 1951 as a specific dedicated theatre for all the different drama societies that operated within the brewery. So far more than just an employer, Guinness was absolutely integral to the development of the Liberties area. You may not recognise him, but the man of the moment is up there on top of that windmill. St. Patrick himself, staff in hand, and he's over four foot tall. St. Patrick of the Liberties is standing on top of a windmill that was once at the heart of the Roe Whiskey Distillery. And you can get a great view of St. Patrick on top of that windmill for yourself if you make your way to Container Coffee and their great rear courtyard space. Dublin, once upon a time, was home to the Golden Triangle. The big tree of whiskey distilleries were here. Rose, Jemison and Powers. But believe me, Rose was the biggest of them. Rose were in business even before Guinness, established in 1757. And just like Guinness, the Rowe family made contributions to the city in sometimes surprising ways. What's a friendly war of philanthropy between friends? Guinness, as we learned, paid for the restoration of St. Patrick's Cathedral, Christchurch Cathedral. Well, that was funded by the Rose. The whiskey distilleries of Dublin were booming through the 19th century, but the early 20th century brought great hardship. A temperance movement in Ireland, spurred on by the battle line and the battle slogan, Ireland sober, Ireland free, and prohibition in the United States of America, both of those things were very bad for business. It's hard to imagine this distillery of some 15 acres just disappearing as Rose did in the 1940s. The name Rowe & Co is back on our shelves today. But in the economic history of Dublin, Rows are very, very important. So we're back to where it all started, the location of the Guinness Brewery. Back in 1759, a relatively young brewer called Arthur Guinness, aged 34, came up to Dublin and signed an incredible 9,000 year lease on a run-down four-acre brewery here at St James's Gate. So over the years, that original footprint grew from four acres to over 50 acres today, right here in the heart of the Liberties area. So St James's Gate Brewery is often termed a city within a city. And by that I mean it had its own railway system, actually eight miles of brewery railway network right throughout the brewery. It had its own fire brigade, it had its own canteen, it had its own fleet of barges that met the Guinness ships down in Dublin port. So the built environment of the St James's Gate Brewery is really interesting in terms of its architecture. The earliest buildings on our site date right back to the time of Arthur in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And you have streetscapes like this, which are really unusual in Dublin city, where you have massive vat houses, which would have housed enormous wooden oak vats, where the beer would have been left to mature before being sent overseas. Enormous warehouses called hop stores, where huge sacks of hop flowers would have been kept waiting for their turn to be put into the brew. When we look at this industrial architecture that stood the test of time, standing here proud for over 100 years, you get the smell of Guinness in the air, that unique smell of roasted barley that almost smells like coffee brewing, that very much imbues the community within the Liberties area. 
So there are plans to transform part of the St. James's Gate Brewery into a Guinness Quarter and that will involve new residential, new retail and importantly new public spaces, opening up the gates behind of the historic Guinness Brewery to the people of the Liberties, to Dublin and beyond. We hope that this walking tour today in this most unusual of St. Patrick's festivals has given you a real sense of the Liberties. Yes, it is one of Dublin's oldest communities, a very resilient and very proud community, but it also has a very, very exciting future ahead of it.